All right, ladies, you are live. Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to this month's training intensive, Child Abuse, Does Covert Emotional Abuse and Double Abuse Affect Our Youth? We chose this topic in honor of Child Abuse Awareness Month and also because we believe it's so important to understand that emotional abuse is a form of child abuse that many don't think of when they hear the term child abuse. So we want to talk a little about that today, as well as various ways we can unintentionally cause emotional abuse and double abuse in our responses to children who have been harmed. So today we are thrilled to have one of the MEN Project's advisory board members on with us, Dr. Kay Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey is the Regional Executive Director of Bethany Christian Services in Southern California. And she is an author who is on the cusp of releasing her first book. Welcome, Kay. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. <laughs> Super oh, excited. You're here. so welcome. Can you share with our audience how you first connected with the MEN Project and what stood out to you? Sure. Um, actually, someone from my staff, um, she attended a training, I believe it was at her church, and she said that, oh, the Men Project came and it was just this exceptional training, and she said that we should connect. <laughs> and so, you know, I learned a little bit about it, and I met Stephanie, I met Jill, I met Annette, and in reading about the men project and just looking at the literature, the website, all of the marketing material, I was just really inspired just to look at it and just to view it because I haven't had a, a personal experience with domestic violence, but I felt like I've been close to it when I was um, like my first boyfriend and I, I got out of that relationship very quickly. Um, and so in that way, like I resonated with it and I have a friend that has a nonprofit that is very specific to domestic violence um, within young teens. And so that really sparked that level of interest. And I knew that our foster parents should be able to have that type of training as well so they can identify um, when a, a, a child or foster child comes in their home, what are some of those signs, signs and symptoms to look at? Mm, that's great. I love hearing that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start today by having you share a little background about Bethany, the work that you do, and what brought you into this field. Yeah, so I'm um, with Bethany. Um, Bethany had Bethany Christian Services has been around for 75 years now, and they actually found me on LinkedIn, um, which was really amazing to get recruited by this global national organization. And what they didn't know is that my personal story is I was also born into adoption. And, um, and I felt like it was just really heaven sent to be able to have the opportunity to become the Southern California Executive Director. Um, and so that's what I do for Bethany. I manage the, we have four, three, three to four offices in La Mirada, Riverside, Camarillo, and we also do work in San Diego with foster, foster care, foster adoptions, and a wealth of new refugee and immigrant services programs, as well as pregnancy counseling. And so it's been really amazing. In addition to that, just in 2020, Bethany, we've impacted 250,000 children. Um, even despite the COVID crisis, we had an increase of about 55% of families just interested in becoming new foster parents and resource families. And so we are continuing to do just amazing work. Well, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> What, what I'd love to hear, just to give us context to what um, brought you into this field is a little bit about your own story. Yeah. Yeah, if you could just let the audience hear, um, because I think that will also let us understand some of the challenges that foster kids face. Yeah, exactly. So I was actually born into foster care. My mother was in prison. Um, and I also found out 
in my early 20s that I was a child of rape. So my mother was also raped. Um, and so I was put into foster care very quickly, later adopted. And then my adoptive mother passed away in my early 20s. And it felt like being abandoned all, all over again and being able to experience like what that loss is and really feel like what a child back in foster care would feel like it's like those feelings of being alone and not having a family um, really resurfaced and I would say as a teenager just as a young person I always wanted to help and I always wanted to give people what I didn't have growing up and so I've been working in social services for over 22 plus years now so I started very young <laughs> Um, but it's always just been an extreme passion of mine. I started off as an after school counselor. I later become a marriage and family therapist. And then from that, I grew um, into working in, in leadership. And that's how I'm at Bethany now. But my story, like I said, just really impacted that level of passion to be able to give back to people and to young people what I didn't have growing up. And that You're was just a warrior. <laughs> I imagine great inspiration. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so today our listeners are wanting to learn more about child abuse. So let's get to it. Why don't you share with us what child abuse actually is? Like what is the definition in terms of the various forms? Yeah. So when we think about just the various forms of child abuse, we think about physical abuse, emotional, psychological abuse, as well as physical and emotional neglect. And then there is um, sexual abuse. I feel like we often hear more about the physical and the sexual side of abuse, which is rape and molestation from someone within the family, physical abuse, a child being literally abused and hit by somebody in the family. But what we don't really hear too much about, um, is, which is why this, um, this talk is so important, is the emotional and the psychological abuse. Um, when we think about what are some of those signs of neglect, it could be a child that is coming to school or to after school program and they have bruises on them or their level of hygiene has changed. Um, level of behavior has also changed. Their sleep patterns have also changed. And so those are some signs that as a mandated reporter, which teachers are, social workers are, um, a, lot, a lot of people in law enforcement and just different areas of the, of the job field, um, they are mandated reporters and they have to really be mindful of those signs and make a report, which is called a special incident report and make that call to CPS or to call the police and say, you know what, this child is showing these type of symptoms. I think we need to go and look into it further. Great, thank you. So I'd like to dig a little bit deeper at emotional abuse as a form of child abuse. But first, I'd like to start with a definition of covert emotional abuse, which um, is a, a large focus of the MEN Project's work. It's the hidden, the hard to name, the hard to describe, the hard to identify um, manipulative tactics and behaviors that uh, confuse a victim, that um, confounds them, and that, uh, well, for example, it could be something like blame shifting. You know, there's a problem, but the child gets blamed even though it could have been something that the parent is responsible for. Or minimization, when the child brings a concern, um, rather than really being in, attuned to what your child's needs are and to discuss it, you minimize it, you dismiss it, you just sweep it under the rug and don't acknowledge it and develop that conversation. It can be false accusations where you falsely accuse the child of misplacing you know, something in the house that is really your responsibility and just this constant blaming and disregarding and putting down, minimizing, telling them they won't amount to much, things of that nature that cause the child to then internalize a lot of self-doubt instead of them being able to identify that it's actually the problem of the adult 
they internalize it as though something is wrong with them. And we know that um, through numerous studies that this kind of interaction um, actually impacts the brain development of children in the developmental stages of life. So what are, what are some common ways that you see emotional abuse against children? Yeah, um, like you said, it's, it, it is difficult to, to identify because physical and say sexual abuse, you can visually see that where you know a child is coming to school with bruises, a teacher can visually see that. If a social worker is going out, we can visually see um, if something, if the, the body language is wrong, or if there may have been some sexual abuse, there can be some signs to visually notice that. But the, on the emotional side, unless a child is saying that, um, my parent is yelling at me, they're making me feel bad. And I think that's probably why it doesn't go um, reported as much because the child has to feel confident enough to, to verbalize it. And so for us, we don't see a lot of reports on emotional and psychological abuse unless that child is with um, working with a clinical therapist and now they're mentioning it to them. And then that clinical therapist is mandated to make that report. So for, you know, for us, our special incident reports are most more often on the physical um, or that just that level of neglect that we're seeing. And it's so harmful and it goes unattended to so often is the case, right? That's what you're saying. When yeah. a child is abused at a young age, you know, in the developmental stages of their life, what does this do to their sense of self? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I would say to their sense of self, there can be an increased level of low self-esteem, um, a lack of confidence, a lack of motivation, even just a lack of energy to be able to thrive. And I feel like emotional and psychological abuse limits that child from really thriving um, with their peers and socializing and even knowing like how to thrive after, you know, after high school, after college, you, we can think of on the mental health side, sitting on someone's couch and talking, well, what happened to you as a child? Well, my mom said this to me, you know, like those are those typical kind of psychological, you know, co conversations or clip what people think of clinical therapy. They think of that, that aspect, but a lot of times it does come from when um, someone was a child and these things or these words happen and they really affected them up until they their adulthood, which is really unfortunate because they weren't, and how can you expect a child to have that level of, of confidence and also not fear what their parent is going to say if they tell someone? And that's the thing, like they have to tell somebody that their parent is acting that way. But in that role, the, you know, mom, you know, mom and child or dad and child, they're not we don't have that level of child development to, to really speak up for ourselves oftentimes. Now you do have children that will speak up for themselves and say like, this is not right, I have to tell someone. And so they become you know a victor in that and they do something about it. But more often than not, a child is scared to speak up when emotional and psychological abuse is occurring. Yeah, it's a big risk because they don't know if the person is going to actually support them and intervene or if they're going to be faced with retaliation sure. by the, their parents who yeah. are whoever's conducting the abuse. Right, yeah. and retaliation can come in the form of physical abuse and then that's when it becomes reported, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. When a child is abused or lives within a family where abuse is taking place, even when the child is not directly the one being abused, what type of emotional or psychological or either, even physical harm does that cause a child? When they're not being directly, but they can, they're just around the environment. Like in a domestic violence household, but the abuse isn't being directed specifically towards the children. Toward them. So they can, so those are the children at times, there may, still may be some displays of behavioral abuse. They may be the child that's going to school and being the bully 
to others because they're seeing it, their parents are modeling that type of negative behavior. So when you think of that child is bullying everybody or they're, you know, they're picking fights and fighting, they're unruly, we also call that oppositional or defiant disorder. Um, so those are the kids that are being sent, you know, if you will, to the principal's office. Um, a lot of times they're fighting in school. So it can come out in several ways, or it's the child that is just very quiet. They may not have any friends. They're very shy. So it really takes somebody that has that keen intuition to to ask those questions, to really figure out like what's going on with that child, because that would be like abnormal behavior. I think um, it's a good point to make that we sometimes assume that they're not being affected by what's going on, but we know that the ACEs study mm -hmm. shows that there's actual physiological I'm sorry, I was interrupted for a second. The ACE study shows that they actually face physiological harm. Like it genuinely affects their brain development. It mm -hmm. leads to long-term physiological issues, long-term emotional issues, maybe addictions. It can yeah. even affect their, their heart. You know, they're at the, at the, um, biological level, it affects their long-term medical health. Yeah, their medical health, spiritual health, mental health, um, even relational. So a lot of times you can see a child that has grown up in a domestic violence family that they may begin to choose their own partners and they may find themselves, you know, kind of reliving that same situation until yeah, they- the user or as a victim. Just yeah on who they identify with the most. I, I just, you know, I see sometimes, um, particularly in the faith community that we put the institution of marriage above the well-being of the victim and children inside that marriage. We prioritize the institution of marriage. We try to hold marriages together um, when in some cases, the best thing that could happen is that that violent home is broken apart so children can actually experience yeah. calm and peace. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, borrowing from your personal story or from what you've seen in your career, what are some of the unique ch challenges a child growing up in foster care experiences? I, you know, I, I've just always heard that foster kids bounce around between home to home. And I wonder why does that happen? And yeah, how does this affect them? I mean, I, it must be so challenging. They're in a different school environment as each time they move, they don't really have the opportunity to develop these long-term loving relationships where they're truly supported in yeah. the process. It just seems cruel to me. What am I not getting how does that happen and why is that so right and so you know with the child that for whatever reason is no longer with their family you know i did an article recently and this young man he went through like 32 homes before he just emancipated out of the system 32 foster homes and so reasons of that be, can be behavioral you know it's just not it's not a good fit or, you know, that foster family, maybe they actually pass away and they have to leave, or he gets kicked out of the school system. Like there's an array of different reasons why a child may bounce around from home to home, or the foster parent may just not no longer decide to, to do that type of work or that type of ministry anymore. Um, it becomes, you know, very unfortunate because when you think of the educational system, they're going from school to school, they're trying to manage their credits, they're losing credits, they're not graduating on time. And so it just really becomes really difficult to have that lack, lack of structure 
Um, their social circle continues to change all the time. They may be taken away. Most often they're taken away from their siblings as well. And so that feeling of just being abandoned, feeling lost, that lack of structure, that lack of just love, you know. Um, and then even with social workers can come and go, um, clinical therapists can come and go, you know, just staff in general just changes all the time. So just that lack of consistency, you know, affects a child and so now they're you know between 18 to 24 trying to navigate college you know for the first time and so if they don't have that supportive network or that person to be able to shine and truly help them persevere beyond adversity which is my the title of my book <laughs> ah. um, <laughs> I'd have to throw that in there. Um, it just becomes very difficult, you know, for that child. They need to have a mentor, which is why, you know, those types of organizations are just so important, like the Nehemiah Project and the Kids in the Spotlight that really help um, Tay Youth, which are youth between 16 to 24 years old, to help them navigate from high school and beyond. Gosh, it's, it's heart-wrenching, really, when you think of just what they go through. Is there anything that the public can do better to help these families or these caretakers or these children? Is there, is it just, it seems hopeless. Like we, there's not much we can do. What, what do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, I, I never would say that there's not much that we can do, especially when there are organizations, say like the Nehemiah Project in LA, um, they have an organization and they help specifically transitional age youth, the youth that are more difficult to place within a foster home are children from, you know, it could be from eight and up, like eight to 18, really, because people, a lot of foster parents think like, oh, their behavioral issues are too difficult and I can't manage that but they still they still need love because if they if someone doesn't help them then they will emancipate out and never have a home never have that family never have someone just come to their graduation you know something as big as that and so other ways to help is being a mentor you know to a child finding these transitional organizations or and of course becoming a foster parent with bethany christian services you know um or being a a respite um, foster parent, which is a foster parent that only comes in if the, the main foster parent wants to go on, on a holiday, wants to go on a vacation, or just have a date night. They can step in and say, well, I can't do it full time, but I can actually help for the weekend. And we need foster parents just to do that. Um, of course, donating to support organizations like Bethany Christian Services as well. Um, and then other organizations, like I said, the Nehemiah Project, they have um, transitional homes and so people that donate property or help with construction. So there's a lot of things If someone really wants to help, call us and we can let you know. <laughs> That's great. Well, those are really good points. Um, you're, you're making me think a lot about what we can do and we there really are opportunities to get involved. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just clarify when you talk about emancipation, they, um, well, two things. When you say this young man went through 32 different homes, why are they in foster care for their entire life? Why are they not adopted? Well, because if he started off, like I said, foster parents and resource families, um, they may come in saying like, oh, I saw, you know, this video, or I saw this commercial, and I want to be a foster parent. And so one of the first questions we ask them is, well, what's your age range that you would like to foster? And they say, oh, from zero to three. And so if you have 100 parents just wanting zero to three, the kid that's been in foster care or starts off or gets pulled away from their family at the age of eight and every foster parent is only wanting a certain age range, then that's the, the child that goes through multiple homes. You know, a, a lot of times a foster family may keep a child for maybe six months to a year. It's, um, you know, you have those special 
parents that will keep them from, you know, three to until they graduate college. And then that's just their family. They may never adopt them, but that just becomes their family. So like I said before, there are so many different stories. Every foster parent is not looking to adopt the child. Um, sometimes they, like I said, they just want to be able to foster and that's it. You know, but maybe why isn't the child put up for adoption. If they I mean, are, they are. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they most likely they are at that point, you know, sometimes they come in for the focus of reunification because their families are getting themselves back together. They may need to go to parenting, substance abuse, anger management, or just an array of different classes. And so a lot of times, um, but if that doesn't happen, if reunification isn't a part of the program, then that child is up for adoption. But it doesn't mean that they'll be adopted, especially if they're not in, I guess, the sweet spot of that age range. So we need more and more foster parents to say, you know what, like, I want to adopt the child or foster a child that's 10, 12, 13 and up, you know, just because they want to provide that love and structure so they don't fall into the system and become an unfortunate stereotype, which is um, becoming homeless and experiencing homelessness and not graduating high school, not matriculating into college. Like these are the main statistics for children that do not get adopted out, that emancipate and find themselves on the street. Oh boy. Well, this brings up what, what we call at the men project double abuse. And that's when um, victims either finally find the courage to speak up or reach out for help. And rather than being believed, they're often judged or they're mischaracterized, they're minimized. Um, and I can see double abuse also happening to somebody, a child who's in foster care and they're already have such a burden of just hardship in their life. And mm -hmm. yet they're not, you know, a foster parent may just say he's too much to handle or mm -hmm. he has one behavioral issue that's repetitive that they don't want to tolerate or whatever. And so the child, rather than experiencing that steadfast, secure love and commitment is abandoned again. And it just must be so layered for these ongoing experiences that these poor children are faced with throughout their lives. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. You know, it's, you really have to, um, like I said, be able to, to persevere and have that level of resilience to, to continue to fight even when you're all alone. You can have a, you know, be a part of a two parent home and still feel abandoned, you know, and so, and still not feel the love, you know, like we hear stories all the time, people that come from affluent families still don't feel that they received everything that they need. And so, and they have a family. And so for these children, it's really up to, to us to be able to mentor and to have that level of ministry and to be able to, to just give back. And like I said, provide that love and that structure because we know how it can turn out, um, you know, which is really unfortunate. Like you have those children that become these amazing people along with just, you know, going through so much, but everybody doesn't have that story of resilience you know, and that's, that's the unfortunate part. And so that's what, that is the message that we want to tell potential foster families and resource families is that, can you give this child a helping hand? Like, can you provide another, a new narrative or a new normal, that's the key word for, you know, this year, um, a new normal for this child and provide them a life of hope and help them push past the pain and like I said, create a new narrative and give them something else to live forward to, to look forward to. Mm. Okay, very good. So I'd, I'd like to know if you could share some ways that we can all respond to children when they're hurt or sharing their stories of abuse or bullying or whatever they might be experiencing. Can you speak to sometimes when it's important for someone to respond well, and then also 
when they need to call CPS and report abuse? Yeah, so, and I'll start with the last part. So in knowing when to call CPS and report abuse, abuse, it's being a mandated reporter. So like I said, it's the clinician, it's the teacher, the social worker, those are mandated reporters. Um, even a neighbor, a neighbor can call if they want to, you're not necessarily a mandated reporter, but if you're like, I keep hearing screaming and yelling and crying all the time. So you're just supposed, if you just suspect abuse, it's not for anybody that is a mandated reporter to go out and say like, I'm going to do a stakeout now and really find out like, that's not, that's not our job. If you just have an inkling of suspicion, then you do, you call that there's a hotline for a child abuse. So you would call that number um so and then for a teacher that is seeing this child and they see like that behavioral change um if they start to see this person you know cover up all the time and maybe one day you see them and these you notice a, um, a bruises on them or they're sitting kind of awkwardly and you're like that looks you know you go up and you ask them you know gently like hey are you okay or you seem like you know you're not as happy as you used to be is everything okay and then you just kind of somewhat monitor that, especially as a teacher that would see a child in the world of in-person, you know, school. <laughs> but um, sometimes it's very hard to, of course, see that virtual, but especially if you're virtually teaching. But pre-COVID, you can see that change. Or if the child is sleeping all the time in class and you knew, and you know they used to be very bubbly, like those are different signs that, not to say like, I'm gonna make a report, but to just maybe ask a prying question, just to like, hey, are you okay? Um, but if it becomes, you know, say within a week, you're like, you know what, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna just watch this child, you know, as the teacher and just let me, you know, I have a question, but I'm not sure. And you may go to the school principal or the school therapist to say, I'm, I'm not really sure. What do you think? And then somebody else can make that determination and make that report if you're still uncertain. Cause like I said, it's not our job to, to investigate. That's the child abuse reporter's job but it's if we have a suspicion then we can definitely just call and then that person that takes the call the child abuse reporter will do what they need to do their due diligence to make sure that it is founded or an unfounded report okay thank you that's great clarification the first part of the question when a child comes to you and let's say they're being bullied how yes. do you like to advise people to respond to a situation like that? You know what, I um, I guess for me, that would be a difficult question to answer because we don't necessarily deal with that. Um, probably like a school, a school therapist would. So they would go to the school therapist, let them know. They would go into the principal's office, but now there are, I know like there's like no bullying policies where kids get suspended, but I definitely can't talk in depth about, you know, what bullying and different things like that. A lot of schools are not enforcing that no bullying policy mm. still going on is my experience. And um, I, I don't know, I just, I think that our teachers have so many responsibilities um, right. and they have so, you know, they're expected to know a lot about so many things and they have, like you said, mandated reporters yeah. on top of um, their normal daily routine. Um, but I wish that schools were more trained because I think that sometimes we don't believe the child who's complaining about being bullied and we minimize that or we um, poorly direct them to go play on the other side of the playground. Like we start instructing the child instead of really intervening and getting to the bottom of what their experience is. So we, we minimize them instead of stepping in and taking action and children can't, they're not at the age to be able to handle this on their own. They need adult intervention and I just, so often don't see schools take bullying seriously where they're going to discern who, you know, it's so often it's a he said, she said 
situation, but they need to do their due diligence and discern what is really happening and recognize the signs of trauma that a child is, that the victim is displaying and interpret that as actual evidence that something must be occurring, even though the bully may be denying it or so forth. So I, I just, we, we care a lot about that at the MEN Project, and I would like to see um, more education around that category. So before we break for questions, I mean, you've just given us a wealth of information, and I'm so grateful that you've been on, but I want to know about your book. That's exciting news, and I. how do we get it? What is the title? What is, yeah. tell, us, tell us about it. Sure. So the title of the book is called Persevering Beyond Adversity, The Blueprint. And so pre-orders will begin on Mother's Day at Dr. 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 K. Renee com so d r k a y r e n e e dot com so super excited so all of that is launching on like I said on Mother's Day for pre orders and so the book is really about the beginning is about my story that I shared that I just shared kind of briefly with you and the audience and then it goes into detail and I speak to about 18 different people and they share their inspiring stories about how they also persevered beyond adversity and some of the key tools that I provide are there are 10 of them but I let people know like they need to have a mentor you know they need to have a level of faith they need to have a level of self-love for themselves to be able to push has anything and so just hearing the the variety of different stories to inspire um, to inspire us to inspire youth young people and then to also help teachers and say social workers help navigate a child that is going through um, perseverance or going through adversity to help them persevere and to help and help and guide them toward the end of their journey or just start a new journey <laughs> that sounds fabulous so I look forward to reading it. Thank you. <laughs> what an act of courage to step out and tell your story. Yeah, um, and it is. I know some, some of the things that I've put in the book, like I've never shared with a lot of people. So even just in writing the book last year, there were times where I had to take a break because it got so emotional for me. Like I needed to take a moment, you know, so I just I hope that it helps people and I hope that it just it gets in the right hands and people can not only read it, but after they read it, like give it to someone else, give it to a child or give it to a mentor so they can help um, that youth that really need that level of resilience. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lauren, do we have any questions? We do have some questions. So let me pull them up one second. My partner is emotionally abusive and I've recently come to realize that's what's been happening in our relationship all this time. Our children are now on the receiving end, especially my youngest seems to get the brunt of it. How can I help them, support them, encourage them in their identity when they're torn, feeling torn down and defeated? Mm. Boy, that's a tough one. Honestly, I think um, what we focus on a lot at the MEN Project is to provide tools and resources. And part of that package of tools and resources is defining the terms and providing definitions for the types of emotional abuse that one is experiencing. So you're actually giving it a name, you're labeling it and explaining it so that the child doesn't internalize it and believe something is wrong with them that they deserve it, but rather really giving it, giving the, empowering the child to identify that it is the parent's fault. But I also would really recommend considering a separation to remove the children from that kind of environment because we know that it can be so damaging. And I know it's not always easy to do, but if you're not able to separate, I would just really focus a lot on educating your children, um, teaching them about different emotions and feelings. You can download these great tools 
um, yeah. that are age specific to give them an, to improve their emotional language that will help them to categorize what they're experiencing without internalizing it. Kay, do you have any comments about that? I, you know what, I would really just piggy, piggyback on what you said. I, I definitely don't want to tell somebody the wrong thing, especially if they're still living in that household um, with, with the abuser. And now, you know, the children are seeing that, um, that, you know, that becomes such a, a difficult situation. And it really is becoming more confident just as, as a woman and having that level of self-esteem to be able to be encouraged and to let your children know, like, even though you're trying to navigate your current relationship to let the children know like this is not okay you know by any means because they are they model behavior they model our, our behavior and so the difficult part in that is that they're seeing that oh well, is this okay if mom is here you know so that becomes just such a challenging you know conversation so for sure for her to get that type of help you know that she needs to be able to come stronger and make those tough decisions for her and her children um, and a follow up to that question, are there any places you can recommend for resources so they can learn more about what their options might be? Oh, I honestly think that one of the best places you can go is your local domestic violence agency because they are advocates. They can help you with um, suggestions for housing, emergency housing for legal help legal aid and they can there's often classes that they offer to help empower you to begin to change your perspective and really make you feel like you're standing on more solid ground than this tumultuous place that you're standing now so i would tap into um, those types of services if if you are looking to try to intervene on your marriage and you don't want to separate or divorce and you want to try to save that marriage, I recommend the Marriage Recovery Center. Um, and you could find them online because they work with both victim and abuser and they are very successful at what they do to hold the abuser accountable at the same time supporting them in their efforts to change and really wonderful group group um, support groups for victims that need the opportunity to share their story and to also um, become change change their own viewpoints on how they can respond and react and handle the situation that they're in um, next question. I'm a youth mentor at my church, and I've been wondering about a couple of the kids that I work with who share their parents are constantly doing put downs or punishing them so harshly. How can I ask them more questions or find out more information so I can really support them in the way they're needing and find out more information without causing harm? Okay, do you want to take that? Yeah, so so like I mentioned before, it's not for us to, to really investigate already. It seems like this person has enough information to, to call. So the people that are trained to be able to investigate can make that determination. Because um, if the children are already saying that they are doing put downs and speaking negatively, then that's enough to make a phone call. Um, you may want to ask, I mean, you may or may not you need to ask, well, how often is it occurring or when was the last time? But then those are investigative questions that that reporter will ask anyway. So it would be safe to make that call. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to speak into the children to help clarify these things for them, to help educate them so they can become more empowered and realize it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, yeah, support them in that way. In addition to what Kay is saying in terms of a follow-up phone call. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good. Lauren, do we uh, have questions? So we have another, one more question. Um, I love the men project resources, but how can I shift them to work with children or are there other resources that might be better for me to use? Well, um, one, if you look at our terms and definitions, uh, it depends on the child's age, but our terms and definitions we have used um, in the junior high and high school age and the kids understand it. Um, even in sixth grade, they, they understand what those terms mean. They might need a little explanation, but I would just simplify the wording a little bit um, to the age bracket that you're speaking to. And then I, I like I mentioned that you can download those, feel, those um, charts. There's actual charts for older ages and there's like um, emotional faces, little like happy, sad, confused faces that help children understand their emotions when they can define their own emotions more specifically, we're increasing their emotional IQ and enabling them to then be able to understand more of um, the terms and definitions that we provide. But I'm wondering, Kay, if you know a specific organization that serves kids who are experiencing emotional abuse? Um, and I was about to say one. Oh my goodness, the, the executive director is uh, Candy Lewis. The organization is called the Positive Results Center. And so that's a great organization. Um, for people to really find out more about and to, for children to get help. It's really centered around children as well and young adults. Great, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we have any other questions? I believe that's it. Okay, thank you. Well, Kay, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. You always bring so much light to a situation and you're an inspiration and I'm just grateful to, that you are on our advisory board and that you're here today. Um, you. Next month's intensive, the Men Project Intensive will be aired on when? Well, we didn't decide the final date because we have a conflict that's just a resolution. Okay, I'm sorry. We have a conflict on the date, so we're going to just make an announcement. Um, later. But um, next week, we'll be offering our introductory training on Wednesday and Thursday morning, April 28th and 29th from 10 to 12 Pacific Standard Time. So please log on to our website at themenproject.com and subscribe to our, um, to participate. You can also subscribe to our blog and our newsletters in which you'll learn more about various trainings that you can participate in, as well as we'll be very soon launching our comprehensive virtual training program, which will be um, probably coming out this fall. So we'd love to have your participation in that. Anyways, um, that's it for today. Thank you so much everyone for being here and God bless. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>